Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode 150, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. And do we have some cool stuff today? So let's get cracking. As usual, the first section of the week is getting started. We got uh, quite a few articles here today. So starting with how to control hue lights with JavaScript, a pretty nice tutorial for controlling your Philips hue lights specifically with JavaScript. Check it out if that sounds interesting. Next off, we got configuring ESLint and standard JS, a pretty simple tutorial on setting those tools up. The following is a tower of React software design architecture and best practices. This is a really big and comprehensive uh, collection, I guess, of best practices related to everything React, starting from, you know, the basic best practices of writing code and to best practices of architecture and component design, which is super cool. So if you are working on React, absolutely recommend checking this one out. Next one is why React Context is not a state management tool and why it doesn't replace Redux. A pretty good write-up, also a pretty big one on what is context, why is it, how is it different, and why is it different from the state management tools and why it won't really replace Redux for the complex use cases. So if you're still confused as to, you know, what's the difference between the context and state management, do check it out. It's a really good write-up. Next one is testing in Deno the basics. Uh, pretty self-descriptive, so won't talk much about that. Next one we got here is drawing 2D meatballs with WebGL2. A really cool tutorial on, well, just as it says, drawing 2D meatballs with WebGL. So it's specifically about two-dimensional graphics and graphical enhancements, I guess, to the websites using WebGL. A really cool write-up, quite recommended if you are into the graphics. Last one we got here for today is 10 best practices to containerize Node.js web applications with Docker, a really good collection of sort of advices slash best practices on how to properly containerize your Node.js app with Docker. Some really good stuff in there. So if you're getting started with Docker or maybe you are working for some time and wondering what can you do better, then this is a really good collection. All right, that's it for the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles and news. We got three major things here today, starting with how I switched from TypeScript to Rescript. This is a pretty interesting write-up on essentially migrating from TypeScript to the Rescript, which is the OCaml essentially. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> I can't really comment much about it because as you might know, I don't really use TypeScript that much. And I never even tried OCaml or ReasonML or any other languages that are basically derived from it or based on it. And it's really hard for me to say anything about it, but it was a very interesting read. So, you know, if you are into the whole world of strictly typed languages and you were wondering what can you use to, well, compile to JavaScript, basically, do check this one out. It seems pretty solid. Uh, some interesting thoughts in here. Again, you know, really hard for me to talk about that because I haven't used TypeScript uh, long enough, let's put it this way. Okay. Next article we got here is porting Firefox to Apple Silicon. A pretty cool write-up on the journey of the Firefox to the new uh, Apple Silicon-based Macs, which is effectively ARM. And uh, yeah, some things that they basically had to do that are less than obvious when porting the Firefox to the ARM-based chips. Pretty cool stuff here. So, you know, if you are curious as to how the process looks, do check it out. There's some really interesting things. Last thing we got here for today is TypeScript, low maintenance types. This is a really uh, good write-up that I think I can relate to. So basically the author here talks about writing TypeScript in a way that essentially allows you to not write types yourself unless it is absolutely needed. And when it is needed, you should take an approach to writing types in a way that is very easy to maintain, right? So this is sort of the main argument. Uh, and... Uh, when you think about it, I really like this approach, right? Because I don't really mind writing types as much, but I think the core problem for me in TypeScript is the fact that it basically, if you use it in strict mode at least, it requires you to write types for everything, even when it can basically detect what type it is, right? Again, maybe I just didn't use TypeScript enough uh, to justify it, but here's, there's like in this article, there are some pretty good examples of what it means to be to write types that are low maintenance. For example, you know, if you have like a bunch of different types and then you update one of them and you have to update all the derived types, instead of doing that, you can actually use the partial of the given type, which is in this case, you know, the merging options. 
Again, not a TypeScript guy, so won't really dive into it. I thought the idea was pretty interesting. So there's like a bunch of other tips here on how to do that. Um, I would probably start using types when they are in the JavaScript. I think I already said this multiple times. I do like the idea of giving strict types to things sometimes to get better auto suggestion for functions, for example, or the public interfaces that people will use because, right, you know, the JS doc can go so far. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely not a fan of setting up TypeScript and the builds process and all that kind of stuff, which is yeah. But yeah, anyway, if you are into TypeScript, do check this guide out. Maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. All right, that's it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks and bit sized awesomeness. We do have quite a few things here today, starting with uh, the new AWS UI from AWS team uh, that is a collection of React and TypeScript libraries for their new design system, which I already seen a million jokes about have you ever seen a good amazon web services user interface which is absolutely fair to be honest like their stuff is complex but their user interfaces are not very good let's put it this way so for now the packages as far as i know are only published on npm and don't really have any source code well obviously you would have to you know pull it yourself and then you can have a look at it but it's not yet published on the github uh, seems pretty cool. So I'm I'm kind of waiting for them to officially publish it to GitHub uh, with the documentation and everything would be very curious to dive into that and see how that works. If you are interested as well, do check this one out. Next thing we got here is the reminder that uh, actually IOJS version 1.0 shipped six years ago today. Something that, well, I honestly have forgot about that at this point, but this was the breaking point of the Node.js community when uh, basically people were so unhappy with the management of the Node.js that they just straight up forked it, renamed it and shipped all the features they wanted in that fork. And uh, that what led to the creation of basically the steering model we have for Node.js today, which is actually quite awesome. So yes, uh, Node.js is, well, IOJS is six years old, the whole drama slash change is six years old, which is uh, kind of cool to think about. It was on Jan 19, by the way, so not strictly today, but hey, this week. Okay, continuing, we got the announcement from Brave. Brave now integrates IPFS natively. So if you want to use IPFS with Brave, you can just use it as normal web pages and it will work out of the box, which is actually pretty significant. So if you never heard about IPFS, it's the peer-to-peer -peer hypermedia protocol that is basically designed to make web faster and better and more distributed and well, I mean, everything that comes along with the peer to peer part, right. And uh, if you ever tried to use it with any other browser, basically, it's a bit of a pain in ass to put it mildly, right. And uh, the fact that now in Brave, you can just put in the IPFS URL, and it will work is kind of mind blowing. And I'm very curious to see how that will impact the IPFS network. Because as of right now, it was a very niche thing that not a lot of people use. So maybe this will give it a kind of a boost. If you're curious about that, do read the announcement, do grab the Brave and try it out. It is, I mean, it's a pretty solid browser. Let's put it this way. It does have a lot of features that are, you know, annoying, but at least they give you a way to turn them off. So that's pretty good. All right, continuing, we got the Chrome 88 now includes CSS aspect ratio property, which is finally as some of the people on Twitter were noting CSS is done, we are finished, we have everything we ever wanted, which I guess partially is true because aspect ratio was missing. And it is a very crucial feature. Uh, because you know, using all the hacks to actually do replicate this is quite annoying. And just using aspect ratio properties actually a lot nicer. So if you're curious, do check out the write up, it's pretty good. And there's like a lot of stuff in here uh, talking about more specifically about when it's useful, what was the hacks before that and so on and so forth. All right, continuing, we got the migrating puppeteer to TypeScript, a pretty good write up from the Google team, albeit short one on how they migrated the puppeteer from JavaScript to TypeScript, a uh, pretty good one. So you know, if you're interested in the path projects take to migrate to TypeScript, do read this one through again, not very big one, just a couple of pages, but a pretty good one. Continuing, we got the announcement, I guess this is a public service announcement, be warned that NPM seven will soon be promoted to latest in the next couple of weeks, essentially. And when you do NPM install minus GNPM, you will get NPM seven. 
which means this will come with a new peer dependency resolution and it might break your code. So if you still want to be on NPM six, you need to explicitly install NPM, install NPM at six, right? So keep that in mind next time you update NPM, uh, if it will become NPM seven, it might break your packages. Like there are still quite a lot of cases where it will break your packages. Uh, so be careful with that, try it out, and if needed, just roll back to the NPM 6. I'm kind of curious actually to see how that will develop because I've been using Node 15 with NPM 7 for, well, basically a past couple of months, I guess, whenever they released the uh, uh, Node 15 with NPM 7 bundled. And I pretty much, frequent. okay, I wouldn't say a lot of time, but I frequently have issues with NPM 7 breaking installs because of, peer dependencies mismatching versions, you know, like the some package needs React 17, the other package needs React 16, they are listed in peer dependencies and the NPM 7 just go, hey, I cannot install it because it there's a conflict, right? And uh, yeah, it's I'm, I'm curious to see how that will develop basically and if that's gonna be a major pain for community or maybe everyone will just update their packages and all of that works nicely because uh, from the performance perspective, NPM seven is actually major improvement over NPM six and it is super fast. So that's like a really cool uh, feature of it. But yeah, we'll see how that goes. Just, you know, keep that in mind. And if something breaks, uh, try to roll back to the older version, I guess, or maybe update the packages um, that might fix everything. There you go. All right, last thing we got here for today is the uh, Node.js annual survey. If you got a few minutes to spare, just, you know, go and answer it. They collect the data to basically figure out the direction Node.js develops in. And uh, yeah, it's always helpful if people answer this. Not super big, some questions are a bit silly, but hey, you know, just uh, take a few minutes and answer the survey if you got them. Right, that's it for tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we are coming to the releases section. We got two of them here today. The first one is Deno version 1.7 that brings improvements, some major improvements to Deno compile, which allows for cross compilation as well as 60% reduction in output size. Not sure what I'm more excited about. Cross compilation is in, or basically half the output size for most of the cases, which is kind of crazy. It also now adds support for the data URLs and imports and workers, which is super nice. And there's a new unstable Deno Resolve DNS API to query name servers for DNS records, which is actually super low level. And I'm not sure why would you want to use it in you know majority of cases, at least. I'm sure there are some use cases, but it's like very low level API here. So if that sounds interesting, do check Deno 1.7 up. Uh, 1.7 out is what I wanted to say. Right, uh, last release we got here is Cypress version 6.3.0, which brings in Cypress Studio, which is a super cool feature. So, you know, if you ever use Cypress, it's a really nice end-to-end uh, -end testing framework. It allows you to basically write tests that run in the real browser and then, uh, yeah, just test your apps end-to-end. -end. It's super, super convenient, super easy to use. But the problem is, or the problem was, I guess, is that, you needed to write tests yourself as a developer, right? So you actually code them. You have to like look for the selectors. You have to do things. You have to like figure out, okay, where do I click? What do I input? And it, while it was a lot more convenient than in the majority of other tools, it was still a bit of a hassle, right? Because it's easier to test by just clicking on things. Well, Cypress Studio gives you exactly that. It allows you to record interactions against the app under tests and then automatically generate tests from what you did, which sounds amazing. I have not tried that yet, but uh, yeah, this seems super exciting and I probably should dive in and give it a shot because, well, you know, this is a super cool feature. So there you go. All right, that's it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libs and demos. We don't really have that many of them here, but some are pretty cool. So let's go through one by one. Starting with at Excalidraw slash Excalidraw. So this is an component for Excalidraw that allows you to embed any Excalidraw sh image share thing into your app, which is uh, super nice. So if you if you never used Excalidraw, this is like the very nice rough drawing service. Where's my search web? There you go. And um, it gives you this hand-drawn style, you know, and it allows you to do some very fancy things. And uh, now you can just embed them. 
which is super convenient. Um, again, it's open source, so you you know if you want to, you can self-host your own version of if Excalibur, if I remember correctly. Let me just double check that. So I mean, yes, it is open source. You can actually self-host it. But yeah, there you go. So that's another step in the development, which is uh, pretty cool. Next thing we got here is Aleph Component. Uh, this is the take on React, Svelte, and JSX. Uh, in this case, specifically JSX with TypeScript. That is, um, well, okay, so this is a prototype, right? So there's like a lot of features to be done, but I like the ideas it has basically. So it, the author here touts ahead of time compilation in Rust, zero runtime, no VDOM, reactive and integrated SSR, which all sounds very fancy. And I will be curious to see how that develops basically when they add uh, the rest of the features essentially, right? Because for now it's just a proof of concept. Uh, but it would be curious to see if something like that could work. Again, the fact that it's written in Rust is kind of great. So there you go. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. Looks pretty promising. Um, again, keep in mind that this is just the MVP and a lot of features are missing. All right, next thing we got here is procedural GL React. React component for procedural GL um, library, basically. Yes, so if you ever wanted to procedurally generate things in GL, WebGL, using React, now you can. It looks pretty nice. The API seems straightforward. I'm not sure what the use cases would be, but hey, you know, maybe you know, so do check this one out. Next thing we got here is Edge SQL, Cloudflare workers providing an SQL API. Yep, you heard that right. So, so here's the thing, Cloudflare workers are those things that run on the edge and basically just allow you to run JavaScript and WebAssembly, right? It's just a tiny V8 engines under the hood. And someone thought, hey, you know, we have WebAssembly, so we can actually take SQLite and embed it in there, right? And then provide a way to query that SQLite using the SQL. And it seems like it works pretty damn well. So there you go. You can actually embed a full on SQLite instance with data into the Cloudflare worker and then allow running SQL queries on top of that with all of that running on the edge, which is uh, pretty damn impressive, to be honest. If you're curious as to how that was built, do check out the source code. All right, continuing, we got Zuknet, end-to-end uh, -end encrypted Facebook Messenger. So this is a fork of the Messer, which is a command line uh, client for Facebook Messenger, but it basically adds end-to-end -end encryption on top of that um, messaging, which, I mean, I guess it's a nice um, example case, let's put it this way, but if you want encrypted communication, why the hell would you use Facebook? Like seriously, there's a better alternatives out there and a lot of them starting with Signal and going off into stuff like uh, Keybase or whatever, right? But anyway, a pretty nice um, tool, I guess. So if you are curious as to how that was made, do check this one out. Continuing, we got Frontal JS, a modern HTML development framework and build tool for your next static website. Just as it says, you know, generate static websites, uh, Babel, SAS, LESS, post CSS support, whatever you can imagine. Pretty much all the modern features are here. Um, with like, yeah, if if you looked for another static website generator toolkit for some reason you weren't happy with what existed, do check this one out. Maybe this is what you wanted. Continuing, we got local reverse geocoder, a local reverse geocoder for Node.js based on geonames. Uh, local meaning it doesn't actually do any queries, remote calls or whatever. So all of that is done locally, which is super convenient when you need to resolve a lot of names or when you don't really care about being super up to date, but still want to resolve that as your longitude pairs into the closest point in the city. And this is a node module for that, uh, which, you know, Super handy again. So do check this one out if you're working with Geodata a lot. All right, continuing we got browser VMJS, an efficient x86-64 virtual machine runs in the modern browsers. It's a QMO based VM that is basically compiled into the, um, I believe it should be WebAssembly, right? Because it's written in C basically. So yeah, it's for now it does uh, support console and um, hard disk with memory FS. And upcoming features are Ethernet and 3D graphics, which sounds pretty bonkers, to be honest. For now, there's a demo which you can run and there's the Python that works completely in the browser, which again is super impressive. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. So if you're curious about the whole emulation and WebAssembly, do check this one out. 
Continuing, we got PostMe, the web workers and other windows. Um, let's try this again. A library that allows you to use web workers and other windows through a simple promise API. I was a bit confused as to, you know, you typically have these channels established between that require more than one interaction, but that's the thing. The promise is basically for establishing that channel and then you get the... Um, pretty simple event listener, event dispatcher that you can use for one specific channel to talk to web worker or other window or whatever, which, uh, you know, seems to be a pretty nice API. So if you're working a lot with those, do check this one out. Last thing we got here is estimator.dev, um, tool that allows you to basically figure out how much turning on modern JavaScript could save on your website. So the way it works is pretty simple. You say, okay, bxjs.dev is my website, calculate how much will I save if I turn on modern only JavaScript. So uh, in case of bxjs.dev, since it's already quite modern, it uses the Gatsby, which is, you know, pretty late version. And I think we targeted most of the modern browsers. So there's still like 4% of JavaScript that can be thrown away for the old stuff and switching yeah, but the savings here are not basically that bad. Um, but if you take something, you know, if you take an older website, I'm sure you can get savings that are pretty drastic. So if you're curious about your own website, do make sure to check out estimator.dev. Right, that's it for Leaps and Demos. Last thing we got here for today is a small announcement. So you people have been asking me to make a Twitter with all the news that I gather basically, and I finally did it. You can now find BXJS Weekly on Twitter. It is exactly at BXGS Weekly. For now, this is managed manually by me, which is sub perfect and doesn't really have all the news that I typically gather. I am going to be doing a live stream where I basically extend the Twitter, oh, sorry, the Telegram Discord bot we have to also share everything onto Twitter. But uh, yeah, for now, it's basically just a slice of what I typically gather. Although, you know, uh, quite a lot of my links actually come from Twitter and you can see all the accounts that I follow over here. So uh, yeah, you can follow it there if you're a um, Twitter user and you want to see BXGS Weekly in your feed. That's basically it from my side. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. If you like the episodes, you know, like it on YouTube, subscribe and all that kind of stuff. You can also join our Discord server if you want to chat about any of that. Um, that's basically it from my side. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show and I see you next time.